And as the last talk of this session and of CCS, we'll have George Argiris from Colombia, and he will talk about SFADF, automated evasion attacks, and fingerprinting using black box differential odometer learning. So rounding up this attack session as one more angle on how you can find vulnerabilities. And I'm very interested in this, this, this talk as well. So thank you. Uh, so I'm going to talk about a kind of complementary technique to what we heard before, AFL FAST, which was a great talk. Um, and again, the same motivation uh, as usual. We are interested in software bugs. But uh, the bugs we are interested in are not so much the usual crash inducing bugs. So what we're going to talk about is more like semantic vulnerabilities. So you can think of having, you know, a file system that deletes file out of the blue. This is not something that you can usually get by a debugger. You need some specification or something that actually determines the correct way the program should work in order to be able to evaluate its correctness. And you can think of many more examples like payment applications, e-commerce applications, and so forth. And another problem is that Sometimes, even the vulnerability specification itself is very vague. So an example here is cross-site scripting, which is a very usual uh, web application vulnerability. And we believe that you know this is a vulnerability for which an actual specification does not exist. And I will explain why right away. So a problem we are going to uh, look at in this talk is basically evaluating uh, web security products like web application firewalls. And what a web application firewall is doing in a nutshell is basically you send a normal input to the application, it is supposed to just forward the application's output to you. However, if you send a malicious input like a JavaScript string, it's supposedly going to detect that and just re reject the request. So now uh, a question that we would like to ask is, is there a cross-site scripting attack that will bypass this web application firewall? And if you think about it, to answer this question, we can not only look at the web application firewall or even the application itself, because the very existence of a cross-site scripting attacks actually depends on what all these browsers consider to be JavaScript. Or, and this is something you can generalize for many other code injection attacks, like SQL injection and so on. So a way to restate this, this question is, we would like to find an input such that it is triggering JavaScript execution on the browser, and on the other hand, it is not considered as an attack by the web application firewall. And you see that we cannot decide that by checking each program individually. We need a combined approach. And the common way to do that is by a testing technique called differential testing. And differential testing is, is based on a very simple idea. So what you want to do is you have a differential testing engine that just generates inputs. And you can do that in a black box manner, like we heard in the last talk, which will be fast, and you just generate random mutations of some initial inputs. And then you throw these inputs in both programs that you are testing. So you can throw it in the web application firewall and on the browser. And then you compare the output for differences. And now the reason that differential testing is kind of popular in this domain is that differences in programs can lead to the discovery of very subtle logical bugs. And the reason is that if you have a very strict specification of what a program should do and you have two programs implementing that specification, then basically if they have different outputs on the same input, then one of them is wrong. Of course, specifications are not so strict in practice, and some of these differences won't correspond to actual vulnerabilities, but it is very helpful and can very uh, 
very usually uh, lead to the discovery of uh, subtle logical errors. And also it has been found to be more efficient than other sophisticated methods. So there was a paper where they were testing and operating a, a file system for uh, a robot that they were sending to, uh, to Mars again. And basically they found that differ black box differential testing was much more efficient than uh, other sophisticated techniques like software model checking or concolic execution and so on. And one of the reasons is because you can implement it as a black box testing technique and just throw inputs very fast as we heard before. So the problem now with differential testing though is that basically there is no feedback loop. And in this case we don't consider gray box fuzzing so we don't consider that we have uh, any inside info on the program we're completely black box. But as we're going to see even the outputs of the program can provide some meaningful information on how to guide uh, the rest of the testing. So here in traditional black box differential testing you just generate new inputs and you basically ignore all previous runs that you had. And we would like to qu ask the question if you can do something better, if you can somehow utilize the previous outputs that you got from the applications in order to guide the testing process. And we are going to do that by using automata learning algorithms in order to use these inputs that we send to the programs to infer models of the programs. And then instead of checking individual inputs for differences, we will actually compare the models themselves. And by comparing the models, this will yield the differences in the actual implementations. So that's the main idea. And I will very quickly go through on a few concepts that we need to know in order to describe the actual uh, architecture of our framework. So the first one is uh, a concept called symbolic finite automata. So symbolic finite automata are a generalization basically of classical automata. And the idea is to be able to work with very large, large alphabets. So in classical automata, if you have a transition uh, from one state to the other with 20 different symbols, you represent that as 20 different transitions. And that ten, turns out to be very inefficient in cases where you have very large alphabets. For example, the whole Unicode set. On the other hand, symbolic automata will group these transitions into one predicate. And it turns out that in practice, when you implement that, it can be very much faster to perform analysis on this kind of automata over large alphabets. And another thing that we found out recently is that this symbolic automata representation is also very much more efficient than the traditional automata representation for machine learning purposes. So learning symbolic representations of this automata is much faster than learning traditional automata over large alphabets. And basically we came up with this algorithm for learning uh, symbolic automata which is an active learning algorithm. So the idea with this algorithm is that you don't feed them data. You basically let them and they query the program and they ask the queries that they want. They get answers from the program and at some point they will output a model. And that model might be of course wrong. So if at some point you find an input in which your model and the actual program behave differently, then the learning algorithm can use that input in order to refine the model and make it better. And here there is a bit of terminology that I will use. So when the learning algorithm queries the target program, we say that it makes a membership query, it just sends an input and it asks, you know, is that input accepted by the program? So you can think in the web application firewall domain or the browser domain, you can ask, is that string malicious or is that string parsed as a JavaScript string? And then you have the equivalence query. And this is the most expensive part of the learning process because in theory it's just a query but in practice you have to do a whole testing process to see if your model is correct. So in this case you basically send the model that you have and you have to somehow check it for correctness. And if you find it to be incorrect then you get back this counter example which you use and you update your model and make it better. So using these learning algorithms, we created what we call differential automata learning. And differential automata learning is differential testing based on automata learning. 
And here is how this works. So we have our two programs like before. And now we have two learning, two instances of the learning algorithm. And I will explain what that red box there is in just a minute. And these learning algorithms are talking with their respective programs. And at some point, they output a model. And that model, you know, might be correct, might be incorrect. Probably it will be incorrect. And now we have a difference analysis algorithm, which will basically take the two models and find differences in the models. So it will find inputs in which model A and model B behave differently. Now we will send these candidate differences in the actual programs. And I, I call them candidate differences because remember that this has differences in the models, and the models might be inaccurate, and most of the times they could be inaccurate. So we will send them and try to verify them. And if they turn out to be incorrect guesses, then we will use them as counter examples and feed them back to the learning algorithm to update the models. And this loop will continue until we are able to either say that we cannot find any difference in the models or come up with a set of verified differences that we can further analyze. And now our tool, SFA diff, is basically this uh, big uh, rectangle which covers all these components. So why intuitively is differential automata learning a good thing? So the first thing is we avoid testing for differences in individual inputs. So the queries that we do, the queries that the learning algorithm do, will basically account for when we check the models, we basically account for all inputs that the learning algorithm performed so far. And that's one thing, and it's related to efficiency. The other thing is that we actually get a model of the program. And even though that model, even after we find differences, might be incorrect, it could very well be used as an approximation of the behavior of the program and used for further analysis. So even though we don't know what Google Chrome is parsing as JavaScript, just having an approximation as a symbolic automaton can be used in many different places in order to evaluate the security of web applications, for example, against, against cross-edge scripting attacks. And the same goes for any other kind of software. And the reason we chose symbolic automata as a representation for learning programs is that they have some nice properties. They provide a nice trade-off between expressibility and efficiency. So basically, we can capture, as I will show, interesting properties of many different kinds of programs. On the other hand, we have efficient learning algorithms, so we can learn these representations efficiently. And moreover, we can actually check these models for uh, equality, which is something we really want to do in the context of differential testing. So I will just touch on this uh, in, it, in these red boxes. So the first thing that we had to do is that I have to say that although these algorithms query the programs, if you just let them query from nothing, they won't come up with much. So you will come up with very simple models, and it will be difficult to keep on generating differences. So we want something similar to what Fuzzer is doing. We want to give these learning algorithms a bunch of seeds. It could be individual inputs. It could be other inferred models specifications, formal specifications, they can have a number of different forms, and tell them to start from there. So cre we created this algorithm that basically allows to do that. So it allows to give some inputs to the learning algorithm in order to bootstrap the learning process. And the idea is that the initial queries made by the uh, learning algorithm would be guided by this initialization model. And as I said, this could be many things. It could be a bunch of seed inputs. It could be a different model that we inferred earlier for a different version or a similar program, and so forth. And now this has uh, certain nice properties. First of all, if our initialization model is bad, it's something totally irrelevant to what we are trying to learn, we want hard correctness. Again, we will learn something maybe not as good as we would have with a good model, but still it will be correct. Um, and also a good initialization model will discover many parts of the program, and it will reduce this need to cross-check uh, the programs a lot of times, and so it will pretty much boost the efficiency of our framework. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is this difference analysis. I will just touch on that. Uh, so we would like, we have two models now that are 
two automata models, and we'd like to quantify the differences in those two models. However, you know, the differences in two automata might be infinite. If you have a loop that is causing a difference, there you will have an infinite number of different inputs, of inputs causing a different output. So what we would like to do is basically somehow quantify it efficiently. And what we came up with is basically we compute the number of pairs of execution paths that will lead to a different output. And um, we have an algorithm that can do just that. It will enumerate all simple execution paths, that is execution paths without loops. And this also provides a way to categorize differences. So given an input that causes a different output, we can see in which pair of execution paths it follows in the models we have. And this way, we can actually bucket the differences into equivalence classes. And I won't get into the details of this algorithm. I just want to show you that it's somehow intuitive, the differences that it returns. So imagine that we have two parsers, very simple ones. The first one is basically uh, accepting everything that we learned in an A, and the other one will accept everything that it will learn in an A and a B. And then the unique simple execution paths that lead to different states in these two parsers the inputs that will be returned by our algorithms are basically the string A and the string AB. So you can see that they're pretty representative and simple inputs that will cause the difference. So this gives you some intuition on that, you know, this algorithm of quantifying the differences actually gives you some intuitive output. Uh, one last thing I want to talk about in, before I go into evaluation is how we can use this framework in order to produce program uh, fingerprints. So in this problem, we basically have a black box, a remote server, which is running uh, some program. And we have a list of candidate programs. And we want to know which one of the candidate programs is running on the target server. So we try to fingerprint, for example, which web application firewall is running on this target server. And we're going to do that as follows. We will first, uh, we will first run uh, SFA diff in, with input having the first two programs and say it will generate an input causing a difference in these two programs. And we will send this input to the target server and get back an answer. Now, because this answer is causing a different output to be produced between P1 and P2, we can exclude one of the two from the possible you know, programs running in the server. And now we can keep going in this fashion um, the same way and excluding one by one the programs until we will finally reach uh, the target program that is running in the server. And we can also do that offline, so you can basically just create what we call a fingerprint tree, where you start from the root and you query the target server for a program causing a difference, and then you split you know, the remaining programs depending on their behavior on this specific input. And that way, you have a simple way of generating, of making a few queries to the target server and figuring out which program is running. So evaluation. So basically, we want to evaluate uh, a number of things. We tried to have a kind of diverse set of applications. So we tested SFA diff on TCP IP implementations. We tested on web application firewalls themselves. And we tested on web browsers. And we basically went to ask the following questions. Where want to ask about the effectiveness of the bootstrapping algorithm, uh, the effectiveness of the fingerprinting algorithm, and how good is it in finding evasion attacks in the context of web application firewalls versus browsers. And the first thing is a more general question in learning. We want to ask if that bootstrapping algorithm is actually uh, make learning more efficient. And to do that, we consider a scenario where you have spent a large budget you know, of time learning a program, say a web application firewall, and now you have a different version of the program. And you, you want to use the, other, the old version in order to infer something about the new one. And basically, we did that. And in order to have ground truth, we didn't use the actual system. We used some regular expressions that are part of these systems. And we found out that basically bootstrapping with in cause a small increase in the number of queries that we will perform. But however, the number of times that we will have to check a model for correctness until we reach the correct model uh, got a massive decrease. So we have like a 1.15 increase in the 
number of queries, but a 50 times decrease in the number of equivalence queries. So that gives us confidence that, you know, bootstrapping is something we should actually do both in the context of differential testing with automata and in general when we use these algorithms for learning. For our next experiment, we try to use SFA diff to find differences between I TCP IP implementations. So this can be used, for example, this is being used for, by tools like Nmap in order to fingerprint operating systems. And what we did is basically we abstract most details from the protocol and we try to see the effects of sending different uh, TCP flags. And in total, we had like six TCP flags along with the combinations of these flags with the ACK flag. And also, automata are not the right model in that case because we would like to, uh, TCP has output. So we replaced automata with transducers, but basically it's exactly the same principle. It's just some technical details that change uh, in the algorithms. So this is uh, how the state machine looks for uh, Mac OS X. And basically, the, I won't go too much into it. The, the green states are the normal TCP session. It's the TCP handshake and the shutdown. While the red states are error states, where you go if you do something that's outside uh, the TCP specification. And in order to infer those, we basically needed around 1,000 queries per model. These models in different operating systems had between seven and nine states. And we found a bunch of differences. So here, uh, what you see is like acronyms for the flag. So S, comma S is that we sent two subsequent uh, SYN flags. And you can see that all operating systems will answer differently. The next thing we did is we tried to fingerprint web application firewalls. So we tried also to produce fine-grained fingerprints in the sense that we tried not only to distinguish between different products, but between different versions of the same product. And to do that, we started with a small subset of regular expression rules that um, these firewalls are using. And then we generate this fingerprint tree that I showed you before. And basically, this is what it looks like. And in order to determine which firewall is running in a remote server, you just start from the root on the left and you submit the string. And if the string is considered malicious, then you follow up the red X sign and you submit the second string until you reach a leaf, which leaf will basically tell you which firewall is running. Now, there are details here that, you know, these firewalls might be a bit modified by the administrators, and we do have uh, ways in order to cope with that, but uh, I won't get into that now. So generating this tree took uh, 23,000 queries overall. We discovered 342 states in all systems combined, and we had to do 68 calls uh, in order to cross-check the models. And also, this is a much smaller tree than the worst case, which could be a full binary tree. We only have eight internal nodes, so it's pretty shallow. We need to do only a small number of queries to identify the target firewall. Uh, the last thing we, we want to evaluate is if we can f use uh, our tool in order to assess the robustness of web application firewall products. And what we did is basically we created a module that will accept as input a string and it will uh, be able to tell if it causes JavaScript execution. I won't get into that now in how we did that. It's all in the paper. You can check it from there. And then we used SFA diff in order to find differences between uh, Google Chrome's JavaScript parser and major web application firewall parsers. And we initialize with small fragments of the HTML standard with some attributes. So this is what it looks like. On the one hand, we have web application firewalls. On the other hand, we have uh, web browsers. We are learning the parser for the browser. We are learning the parser for the web application firewall. And we're just keeping the differences where the browser executes firewall and the web application firewall consider it not to be an attack. And we have found a, a bunch of different attacks. Uh, I'm, we'll only discuss for that one, which is in, also in the paper. So basically here, the web application firewall didn't take into account that after this equal sign in the attributes, you can have uh, non-alphanumeric characters. And this happens because basically, at this context, you started executed Java, executing JavaScript. So there, what you have is basically a question mark ending, ending a statement. And you can trigger that with 
many different uh, character variations, three or four. Um, and however, if we, if we use our categorization, they would all be categorized in the same root cause. And basically, it's that there is a missing state on the web application firewall parser in order to account for this non-alphanumeric um, characters that could be used. So this attack was found in less than 10 minutes and using less than 10,000 queries uh, combined in both systems. Uh, so I will just show you a demo of the tool. Um, so we will release this tool next week. So this is basically, we run the tool in order to find the attack that I showed you before. So you can see here uh, that now it is learning basically a model for the browser. That's why you see this image flashing. Basically, we use that in order to determine if JavaScript execution occurred. And you can see it's basically doing some kind of fuzzing. But in that context, you know, all strings are determined in order to learn something. And now it's learning a model for the web application firewall. And it will basically start now cross-checking and it finds some invalid attacks and refining the models continuously. And you can see it got up a few states. The models are getting bigger by these refinements. And basically, at some point, it will find the attack, I guess it's now. So yeah, now it found the attack. So yeah, in this specific instance, we had the smaller initialization model, so it didn't do 10,000 queries, it did something like 3,000 combined in both systems. So I just want to show you that if you can see the, the strings that submit, it looks like it's fuzzing something, but all these are the result of, you know, thinking that it found an attack, but that attack being uh, a result of insufficient knowledge about the parsers it is learning. So you can see that it kind of makes sense. It focused on after the on click and attribute and it's trying different variations there, but they turn out not to be working. So it refines the model and learns more and then trying new attacks. So to conclude, we presented SFA diff. It's a black box differential testing framework based on automata learning. And we used it to find difference in a variety of programs to generate program fingerprints and invasion attacks. Now, the models produced, as I said before, they can be of independent interest, like getting an approximation of specification. I also would like to stress that this is not uh, something that it's, it's orthogonal to other testing methods. So tools like AFL or AFL Fast, they can use to augment uh, these kind of tools. So you can use AFL fast in order to find discrepancies between the model learned by SFA diff and the actual implementations. And then these inputs found by the fuzzer could be used to further refine the process. So we really believe that it's a complementary approach and we, we will try to expand on that in the future. And also this tool that you saw, uh, we, we are going to release it in the next week probably and it contains all these algorithms and a nice user interface. And that's all, thank you. We only have time for a very, very quick question, if there's any. Okay, as an administrative note, there will be the CCS uh, business meeting in here starting in about two minutes. So if you want to stay, feel free and ask questions. Uh, this concludes the last session of CCS. Let's thank all the speakers again. It was a great session.